you know, might be valuable. Josh. Hey, look, there I am. Oh, yes, that's me. Okay, that's great. Hi, guys, I'm back. I'm back. Wow. That was fantastic. Very well done, guys. Uh, it's, I heard it's such a rich resource. I've been asked to share my personal story, so I wouldn't go into my iHeart participants with all of this stuff necessarily. This is my story, and I've, I've framed it stories of metamorphosis. Um, and I'm gonna break my talk into three different parts. The first one is me as a colorful caterpillar. You can see, that's me over there. The, the second part is psychosis, my bipolar cocoon. And the third part is continued metamorphosis because it's a perpetual process of action. And my wings are hiding beneath there. They're not properly out yet, but they'll come out eventually. So it's continually a process of growth. So the reason why I chose stories, um, this is a beautiful blend of, of the spiritual space as well as the psychological space and just the human space. And so stories are powerful in both psychology and in theology. And I'll quickly touch on why. In psychology, our narratives, the way that we see the world, the lenses that we look through, that determines what our reality is. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT is very focused about our thoughts direct our activity, direct our behavior, which directs our outcomes. So thoughts are very important and stories are, that we tell ourselves are important in that. Um, in terms of, of spirituality, I'm going to talk about the Christian tradition today, although I recognize the rich diversity of wisdom that there is in all the traditions. Um, in, in Jesus' life, he spoke in parables. That's what he did. He told these stories that could reach people on multiple levels depending on where they're at. And he did that for a reason. The nation of Israel, they would tell themselves their own story time and time again, where they've been, where they're going, who they are, establishing their identity in God and, and in their destination that they've been called to. And I think um, the destination that we've been called to is a big powerful factor. Um, there's also multiple levels of interpretation of stories. There's literal and allegorical or metaphorical interpretations. And so for instance, the scripture that I put up here is Galatians 4, where Paul talks about um, the, the children that he had through Hagar, uh, who Abraham had through Hagar and through Sarah, they're actually analogies, they're metaphors as well for the law that was given on Sinai and the freedom that comes through Christ. So the stories that I'll be telling them, uh, they see them as stories and, if, and there's literal and metaphorical interpretations and if anything I say offends anyone, I'm sorry about that and I meant it the other way. Let's <laughs> go with that, just go with that. Okay, so let's skip on here. So this is uh, Romans, we already heard from Romans today, a powerful letter by Paul. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That way you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now the Greek word for transform is metamorphosis. It's this development into this higher dimensional being. You know, what if the world is one big womb and we're being transformed into a higher dimensional creature? Maybe we're all in a process of metamorphosis. We are all in a process of metamorphosis. So although I'm talking from a bipolar perspective, guys, this is human consciousness. We're talking about the nature of reality here. So please take what nothing you can and ditch the rest. <laughs> okay, so the first section is me as a colorful caterpillar. Um, and my story, it doesn't start with me. We're all part of meta-narratives that transcend us and work through us. And it comes through our genetic line and it comes through our spiritual line. And so my story through my genetic line came from bipolar and schizophrenia on both sides of my family. And you know what, I'm actually gonna, my mom can't be here today, so I'm gonna ask Monica to film this because she would love this, not just once. <laughs> Because she will especially love the part where I call her a saint. <laughs> she was going to be here. Um, so yeah, on my dad's side, um, he had bipolar that was mismanaged, unmanaged, as well as substance abuse, which affects 75% of those of us with these diagnoses. That actually ended up costing him his own life. He couldn't take his own narrative anymore, and it ended his narrative when I was 18 years old. On my mom's side, she is a saint. Mom, I love you. Uh, she she single-handedly raised my brother and I in South Africa um, on minimal income in a third world country. She pulled it off and uh, she has such deep spiritual roots. I was raised Catholic. I went through catechism and got confirmed and did all that thing. I was born and raised in South Africa, which is a, a rich country of spirituality. It's called the Rainbow Nation. There's 11 official languages. 
Um, it was in the, the process of its own metamorphosis at the time, transitioning out of apartheid and into an era of, of reformation. Guys, with metamorphosis involves mass. If, if when, a butter, when a caterpillar goes into his cocoon, he has to dissolve into the cocoon to emerge as the butterfly. If you're doing renovations on your house, you've got to make some mess, you've got to smash down some walls, you've got to create some dust, but you've got a, a goal in mind. And that's why I'm framing this in terms of stories, because the way that we see our diagnosis, the way that we see reality, really affects where we go, whether we're excited about going there, and what, what the deal is. Um, in Africa, they also have different conceptions of mental illness. So we have to take cultural competency in the psychology field. And one of the, the conceptions that they have of mental illness is um, if you're experiencing symptoms of bipolar or schizophrenia when you're young, a lot of the time you're taken aside in the tribal communities by what's called a sangoma, a witch doctor or a shaman, and you're taught how to navigate these states. And oftentimes you're trained to be a spiritual leader of the community into the future. Before I was diagnosed by bipolar, that's me over there with my brother, and that's in a place called Trans Sky with like grass huts. And the Sangoma noticed me and he, he took me into his hut and he said, I want to take you as my apprentice and teach you how to talk to the birds and the animals, and you come live with me. So I decided not to do that. I did, <laughs> <laughs> I did eat his spinach though, so I don't know if this, that's got anything to do with it, but I ate the guy's spinach. But just to say that, guys, there's different ways to view this. Uh, we can't be chromocentric and see, think that we've got it all figured out in this day and age. We can't be culturocentric either and think that the West has got it figured out. So let's, let's keep an open mind and heart. Maybe Africa's got a thing or two to teach us. Um, and I couldn't be content uh, without knowing what was out there. So after high school, I engaged on a, a decade-long world travel ex expozanza. And that's in the next slide. So I've been to, I don't know, 24 plus countries, working in many of them. Um, it looks like a very colorful and dynamic life. I tell you what though, I think my life is more colorful now. I've found deeper riches right now um, than even those times. But it was beautiful. It was a grand old time. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Psychosis. My, my bipolar cocoon. So. As I said, I'm going to use um, stories as archetypal frameworks that we can view these things through. Disney has taken on a whole new meaning for me since I've been through these things. Every story seems to be about this in some capacity. Um, so Alice in Wonderland, um, I, I took two peeks down the rabbit hole and started to slip and then caught myself. Um, one was in San Francisco and the other one was in Cape Town. So in San Francisco, I'd been smoking marijuana, which I will refer to as weed for the rest of the talk, since I was about 16. And I was 22 when I was in San Francisco. And I'd smoked a bunch of times, but this time I prayed for the Holy Spirit in the mirror. Everything went dark, a red light came on, and I saw everything from a different angle. Um, I thought I could telepathically communicate with this dog. I was receiving higher dimensional communications that had me pacing up and down. Um, I could tell when my phone was going to ring and who was calling me. I could look into my brother's eyes and see deep into his soul. Um, I knew when the birds were going to fly past. Um, and, I was, and, and the thing with this time is I managed to crawl back out of the rabbit hole and after the weed wore off, I came back down to sober reality. And I was like, whoa, what was that? So that blew my mind open. It pierced the veil until I realized the things that I'd learned about in catechism. And I'd always prayed to Jesus when there were sharks. So, like, Jesus saved me from the sharks. But it wasn't a, a reality to me. Now I saw that all this stuff was real, guys. I read the Bible through seven times in six months. I became obsessed with all of this. Absolutely fascinating. And what I found was that the saints and the spiritual masters throughout the ages and various world religious traditions validated the same experiences. And I was onto something and it fueled my fire. It led me to get my degree in psychology and I'll continue the story from there. Um, the same thing happened in Cape Town a couple of years later. Um, I, the matrix comes into it, that there's those two hands up there offering the red pill and the blue pill. You, you can take the blue pill and you'll wake up as if everything was just a dream. You take the red pill and you stay in Wonderland and you see how far the rabbit hole goes. So I started to see um, matrix themes in a nightclub in, in Cape Town. And there were all these, these signs that were leading me in various directions, synchronicities as Carl Jung would call them. And I followed the signs until my mind took off without me. Um, and it was this exciting endeavor I saw the cycling of karmic energy. The people who I was with were changing back and forth between various different people. Um, I thought that I had died as I was crossing the street. 
But this time I noticed a malevolence to the higher dimensional communications that I was getting a darker side. And that scared me. And I stopped smoking weed for eight years after that. I thought I needed to research this more. Um, so I traveled, I came to San Diego, California, the best place in the world, tied in my hometown of Cape Town, South Africa. Met my beautiful wife, pretty over there. <laughs> so, she, she's been through a lot of this with me. Um, so I actually, because I, I validated the, uh, how real theology is, I went to seminary up at Fuller Theological Seminary and got my master's degree in theology. And while I was studying that, um, I was praying to God. I was fascinated with psychedelics and the intersection with the spiritual realm. Um, I, I felt like I was being led by God and my professors um, to smoke weed one more time and see what I could do. So this time I went up into the mountains of Crestline, beautiful landscape, smoked weed again, and this time I didn't come out of the rabbit hole. Bam! Pierced through the veil, but when the weed wore off, I was still stuck there for a, a month and a half, cruising around a cyclist. It's okay, so here's the, this, here's the fun side about it. Um, the line between my inner worlds and outer worlds dissolved until the self-other dichotomy was gone. I was the world, and the world was my lucid dream, and I was every one of you guys, and you guys were, were all me. There was only one entity in the room experiencing itself through multiple aspects. It blew my mind. I was able to access psychic phenomena which were actually externally verified. How is this possible? So I told my best friend something that happened to him when he was 11 years old that he had never told me very much in detail. Um, I was able to predict the phone number while I was in, in jail of the guy who was trying to call his girlfriend. I was like, no, you got the phone number wrong. It's this one, that one worked. Uh, my brother said that I was reading his mind verbatim. Um, so, so that was fun. That was very interesting and it was leading me. It had a mind of its own. It was all a lucid dream. Law enforcement doesn't necessarily like that. <laughs> I got arrested up in Crestline because they thought I was an LSD. Um, so I got thrown in jail that time. I got arrested again when I was in Pasadena because the spirit of my dead grandfather told me to steal a plate. Either he was trying to get me hospitalized or arrested or something else, but I ran straight into a cop as soon as I left the door. Bam, straight into a cop, so I got arrested for that. Um, I've been 51, 56 times. Um, it's, it's devastating each time, it's also very interesting in there, there's, a, there's an alternative society in there, um, very interesting. I uh, made $86,000, I had to sell the house that we owned um, in my mania, I was giving it away to homeless people and I was spending it on creative pursuits. In my depression, I couldn't work and I had to pay the rent for this money, so there goes 86 Gs plus my student debt. So. There's also a dark side to all of this. So that's me and my mania. Alice, remember, she's in the house and she grows so big in her grandiosity that she destroys everything around her. And then that's me in my depression where you go so small that even the flowers are scary, depending on the fruit that you eat. Um, and the dark side was a confusion between light and dark. Dark seemed like the most potent form of light. And I was flitting back and forth between Je being Jesus and saying, pop, 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 Jesus and Satan. And I later came to, to learn that the Mormons believed that Jesus and Satan were brothers, which is what I believed at the time. Demon oppression and demon possession, that's a bit of a catch-22. We don't want to see these states as evil. We don't want to label them as that. And yet there was profound wisdom in, in the Bible and in spiritual traditions to say that there's some sort of phenomenon that was valid there. I, my eyes changed. My wife can attest, my voice was different, the way I was acting, I started smoking cigarettes and swearing, which is so uncharacteristic of me. Um, I changed my name. I was, I was someone else. So I really felt like I was, I was demon-possessed. I called my mom, who was in South Africa, and said, guess what, Ma, I smoke weed and I'm possessed by a demon. So I think we, we need to address these from a sophisticated um, point of view, combining psychology mm -hmm. and spirituality, because there's something up with that. At one point, I was so out of my mind and so stressed about what to do about that, that all I could do was pick paint off a trampoline, trying to keep, pick off the paint, and my chain would fall off, my cross would fall off every time I would get into these states. It never, never falls off. What's up with that? And uh, so, in the, in the, when you get 5150, typically they put you on antipsychotics. Um, that's what happened to me. They put me on a certain type of antipsychotic, and when I took little doses of it, I felt normal, I could function, I could write my papers. But what often happens is that when you're 5150, they put you on a really large dose, uh, maybe for liability reasons, and that shuts down all your cognitive functioning. So I couldn't, 
um, do school. I lost all my creativity. I had to drop my classes at Fuller. I couldn't work. I didn't want to engage with anyone. Um, life felt so dull. All I could do was lie in a park in Pasadena and read the Book of Job over and over. It was really the worst time of my life. The worst time of my life. I, I can normally think my way out of stuff, but I just couldn't think my way out of it. So some of these um, archetypal stories that can provide patterns for this. Alice in Wonderland, so she's falling asleep in the realm in between sleeping and waking in what, what's called the alpha state. And she notices that a rabbit shouldn't have clothes on. And so that noticing that something was off, she follows it down into a world where she asks for directions, but they say, well, where are you trying to go? And she says, I don't really know. Then they say, it doesn't matter where you go. If you don't know where you're going, it doesn't matter where you go. We need to have purpose and direction. Depending on the, the, the substance that you eat, you can either grow smaller or you can grow larger. That's to do with medication, that's to do with psychedelics as well. In The Matrix, he's exposed to a world that is um, a higher dimensional version. He's outside of himself and realizes that society is all a social construct and that he's on, a, on the outside of it. And actually, it's a mutual dream that he can tweak and he can develop superpowers if he's able to engage with it. Um, so some of these archetypal themes run through these stories. And there I am, don't worry guys. There was a metamorphosis that happened, it's all good. There's me as a butterfly, that's who I'm becoming. Um, so what helped? With my mania, medication helped. Like I said, when I was on a small dose of antipsychotics, I was able to function very well. Medication really did help me. Um, I saw, I've come to see it as we're, we're both animal beings and angelic beings, um, creatures of the mud and creative spirits, and medications can be the tool that helps you to gravitate, gravitate at just the right altitude, and so they, they helped me with my mania. What also helped was, um, it's more glorious the more you drag it out. That, that came to me during my, my manic episodes. Um, I've been very interested in near-death experiences, and there's a lot of overlap with psychosis, and we're gonna find out all this stuff anyway, and we're gonna see all of these revelations and epiphanies anyway. So I'm just gonna enjoy my cruise in the space-time continuum and go deep, deep as possible, because we're gonna to get to have our cake and eat it anyway. <laughs> Investment in this world. See, my, my imagination is a fascinating place and it's really fun to be there. Now, this world is a very fascinating place and it's really fun to be here. This field, I think we're on, on the forefront of some sort of a revolution of consciousness here, and every day is magical to me. Magic is real, it really is, and, it, and it's the placebo effect as well as the faith. If you believe it is, then it becomes real. Um, so my, my reality is really magical. So that made me not want to be magic anymore, and to actually accomplish real stuff within this space-time continuum. What helped with my depression? Um, again, medication. So I didn't mean to put medication at the top of both of those lists. Um, I, I think, like I said, that it has its use when we see it in the right framework as a tool that can help us swim, that can help us gravitate. Cutting edge neuroscience, and if it's framed in that way, um, and we can use it as a tool, then it can be a beautiful thing. Um, but medication did help with depression. Normally they weren't prescribing antidepressants to people with bipolar 1 because of the them into mania. I found someone who was able to prescribe it to me and it sent me into mania. <laughs> it also got me out of my depression. Um, the right environment, the right people. This is, this is the right environment. Surrounding yourself with like-minded people and people who are ambitious and entrepreneurial and getting things accomplished. And if you saw earlier, my brother and I had, uh, we, were, we cruised around in South Africa selling cookies and fudge door to door. Mm. There's, there's an entrepreneurial spirit and, and a call in all of us to belong to something larger, something that transcends us, something that's going to change the, the fabric of the cosmos for the next generation and the generations after that. So that really helped me um, with my depression, as did shifting my paradigm. I started to think about my spiritual heroes and I thought about Samuel lying in bed and hearing a voice calling out to him and him going to Eli saying, what's up, what's up? And Eli's like, that's God. Listen to him say, here I am, speak Lord. Um, now I think, what about in a Western paradigm, what would happen if, if that same situation had to happen? I think about Jesus. I think about the great career he had lined up as a carpenter. And then he, he, he comes up out of the water of baptism and he goes into the desert for 40 days not eating anything. That's criteria for grave disability right there. Having <laughs> <laughs> these, yeah. these understandings, these apparitions, these hallucinations that are telling him he could be the king of the cosmos and of the universe. Sounds like grandeur. He's, he's being told that he can jump off the temple and fly, and don't worry, the angel's got your back. These are the type of things that I was being told, but what does Jesus do? He submits in humility. 
he chooses to, to, to die to, to, to the call to ego gratification. Instead, he dies to, the, to, the, to that and accepts the will of God. And these are the people who can teach us how to navigate these states of consciousness, which are, I've experienced, very real. So I have a passion for navigating these terrains from spiritual angles. And what helped me get, uh, get off weed was, again, investment in this world. Um, now it's stopping me from being as good at stuff. I want to be good at stuff so I can do stuff, real stuff that's going to change things. And so I'm invested in this world. I'm excited by this reality. They did a study with rats where they put them in a cage with nothing but cocaine water and regular water, and they would drink themselves to death on the cocaine water. Then they made a rat paradise, and they put a bunch of um, female rats in there, they put balls and beautiful things and little slides and stuff. They put the same cocaine water and regular water and the rats hardly ever went for the cocaine water. So your, your environment, the reality that you build for yourself with other people, the connection, we're isolated in Western individualism, that helped me to feel, I, I, I want this over the weed, I, I saw something higher. Um, and then an awareness of the dark and deceptive nature of these psychedelics, it's like the Disney apple that's really shiny on the outside, but it's poison on the inside. It's, there's a deception that comes with these things. So I wear multiple hats. There's me as the Mad Hatter. <laughs> Pouring tea in my ear. And then there's me graduating from Fuller Seminary with my master's in theology. <laughs> 2.82 GPA, and that was when I went through all my ups and downs. And so we can wear these multiple hats. Um, and it's enriched my life. It's maybe not the best career goal to get a master's in theology, which you can do with that. But it's made my reality so magical. It's helped me to see these meta narratives that are the best thing that I could have done. Um, so these are uh, just quickly some of the things that did help me uh, with this continued metamorphosis, like I said, it's still happening. Uh, being involved with church, the Depression Bipolar Support Alliance, DVSA, connecting to like-minded individuals, um, non-judgmental people, clubhouses and the mental health events like this, um, the RAP Wellness Recovery Action Plan and the peer employment training classes. I started a movement named Aslan's Rainbow, which has given me much purpose and direction and introduced me to a lot of interesting people. There's Facebook groups that explore these types of things that can give you alternative perspectives. Um, and then I got working for I I get to do this and I get paid to do this. It's ridiculous. It's beautiful. <laughs> to cruise around and connect with most interesting people in reality and help them accomplish their own goals. It's absolutely fantastic. So that's actually been a real aspect of my wellness. Um, what helped me is looking at psychology through the lens of Carl Jung and other people, uh, of spirituality through non-duality, and of the future. Um, I think that, like I said, we're on the brink of something big here. There's, psychedelics are being legalized left, right, and center. As you know, a bunch of states have legalized weed, um, and all psychedelic plant medicines have been decriminalized in Oakland and also in Denver, magic mushrooms have become legal. There's a very close link between psychosis and psychedelics. In fact, psychedelics were originally named psychotomimetics because they mirrored psychosis so closely. So with this legalization wave, we're about to see a huge wave of psychosis wash over America and of the world. In fact, South Africa, they've just they've made weed legal too. So if people don't have any frameworks to navigate these states, they're not gonna know what to do. Um, Joseph Campbell, the famous mythologist, says the person in psychosis is drowning in the very same water that the spiritual master swims with delight. So if we can teach people how to swim, we could be on the brink of something beautiful, a wave of prophets or, or, or frontier riders. If we don't have conceptions of how to navigate these spaces in the West, like we're taught, Adam, we're just atoms bumping into each other, but yet we're supposed to find our own meaning, but we're told there's no meaning. So we need to balance the Western reductionist approach with some different models. Um, and, so, and also a model of neurodiversity that helps people to appreciate diverse brains and, and the way that we're made instead of sticking people in boxes. I'm a champion for these types of things, to help people feel that they have talent and they have gift to offer the world, and to bring that out and to fan their own flames into fruition and set the world on fire for that. Yeah, and that's a beautiful thing right there. So here's the last slide. Um, some further things that helped me to look into in-depth psychology, there was the, the thinking of Carl Jung and Stan Graf, 
in science, quantum physics, panpsychism, biocentrism, and Rupert Sheldrake. In philosophy, idealism, that everything is mind, and postmodernism, the appreciation of diverse perspectives. From the spiritual angle, Richard Raw, Rob Bell, Advaita Vedanta, Meister Eckhart, and St. John of the Cross. And there's a bunch of geniuses and creative geniuses throughout time who've had diagnoses. I think we're on the brink of something beautiful here, guys, and it's happening right here in this room. And it's an honor and a joy to be a part of it with all of you guys, and thank you very, very much. <laughs> Job. I never met anyone with your job. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, you need to go on the speaking circuit. Yeah. So, so, okay. <laughs> so uh, let's give Josh another hand. I'm rarely speechless, but I'm speechless right now.